Welcome Home Go, inspiring you to find ways to serve, engage, and make a difference. Making it easier for you to find hope in your busy world. Our original production on Good Life 45, where hope happens. Go, make a difference. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I want to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home Go, 30 minutes of discussions on challenging topics that will inspire you to go make a difference. This shorter version, a spin-off of Welcome Home, was created because we know you're super busy. So we've made it even easier for you to find hope, to grow in your faith walk, and then go and make a difference in this challenging world of ours. You'll still get the same meaningful, inspiring discussions on topics that we believe Jesus would want us to respond to by serving wherever we're called. Our focus on Welcome Home, Go is to encourage you to find ways to serve that fit your lifestyle and your set of God-given gifts. These next few minutes together, let's listen and learn how to mobilize our families, our friends, our people, and do something to make a difference in someone's life. Maybe it's just one person, but go, serve, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and enjoy with me now. Welcome home, Go. Make a difference. Oh, viewers, I'm so glad that you're here with us today because you are in for a big treat. You know, we're being talking about what do we do when life throws us a curveball? And there will be curveballs coming our way. And our guest today is uh, was a victim. I'll, I'll just say it like that. She actually was a victim of a curveball that changed her life, and I dare say changed it in a lot of ways for the better because she's here with us today and she has a God story that's going to really inspire you and um, to help you know how to deal with curveballs when they come your way. Melissa Ann, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Barbara. I'm super blessed to be here. Well, you are already a blessing. I read a little bit about your story, heard about you. You're obviously a quadriplegic. You're paralyzed from the neck down, right? Similar yes. to Johnny Erickson Tata that yes. we interviewed not too long ago and you and Johnny have probably a lot in in common with your stories. Did you ever yeah. read her book? I have not read her book, but I am going to. I think that that would be a good, I read that book back when I was, I can't even remember, probably in my in my 20s, because it happened to her when she was about 16, that yeah. she was in a, a diving accident, and it changed her life in a lot of ways for the better. I don't know if you're yeah. able to say that or not, but I want you to tell us a little bit about your story. Why are you a quadriplegic, first of all? Well, this happened uh, this year, I actually, actually celebrated 10 years ago that I broke my neck. I was 18 years old and I had just graduated high school and I was in a rough place mentally where I had experienced my first breakup and I was getting ready to start college and I was mentally just, I guess you could say the word was a little unstable. I was going out one night just to hang out with some friends and alcohol wasn't going to be part of the plan, but I ended up being around it. I was around people that were drinking and although I didn't want to drink, I did end up having a few beers and my original plan of sleeping at this friend's house ended up changing. After a few hours of drinking, I wanted to go back home. Mm -hmm. Nothing in my mind felt better than getting back to my bed. Right. So I ended up getting in my truck and I had a friend that came with me. She got in my passenger seat. Mm -hmm. I told one of my friends at the house that I'll text them when I get back home. I put my truck in drive. I got out of that neighborhood and I had no idea what was going to come next. I ended up getting on the main road and after stopping at a traffic light and continuing, our two lanes merged into one. Well, a man was next to me and he cut me off. A mix of the alcohol and just... Uh, speeding and wanting to get home, mm -hmm. I ended up losing control of my truck. The back end of my truck began to start sliding off the road. I was able to get back on, but roughly about 100 feet later, my back right tire got caught and my truck just started flipping. Mm. Neither one of us ended up putting on our seatbelts and my truck ended up flipping somewhere from eight to 10 times. Mm. The guy in front of us, he didn't stop, he didn't call 911. He in no way helped us after the crash. Probably felt guilty because he maybe maybe, maybe he was drinking it. and driving as well. Yeah. Was it maybe late he, at night? It was 3:30 in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've never seen him since, but crazy enough, there was a man sitting on his porch about a mile away. 
and him with his son. They both, they both heard the sound of a vehicle flipping. They knew what it was and they came to help out. And when they got there, uh, my friend Leanne, she was laying on her back, delusional, speaking, mumbling, had no idea what just happened, no idea what she lived through. And they were trying to keep her as still as possible as they attended to me where I was on my stomach. They said my chin was resting on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I went into a coma immediately. Mm -hmm. So there were no signs of life, but they called 911 and they transported us both to the hospital. So you have no memory of that night after no the memory. accident happened, but you I remember, remember the brake lights and yeah. that's it. Yeah. So once you get to the hospital and you, how long were you in the coma? I was in a coma for 10 days. 10 days? So I don't remember anything. And your sweet Nothing. mom, who is here with us today, yeah. I'm sure she was at your side right away. Uh, yes, right? Uh, a lot of family and friends were in. Can I tell you something crazy? And actually, it's not crazy. It's God. Ten days after the accident, when I woke up, I ended up speaking to my mom for the first time. Mm. And there was a ventilator that was in my throat giving me my oxygen because everything had shut down. And it took away my voice, but I was able to whisper. And my mom was next to me, and I just started talking to her. Mm. And I told her, I said, I was like, Mom, I feel so stupid. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, she said, what do you mean, Melissa? And I told her, I was like, Mom, I feel so stupid. I kept arguing with God. Wow. And she said back to me, she said, what do you mean you argued with God? And I told her, I just kept begging him to please let me go. I don't want to live like this. Wow. And I just kept arguing and he told me no. And he told me that he'll save me and that I have many things left to do. And as I was saying this stuff to my mom, I don't know if I knew uh, the extent of the reality that I was coming back to, but I think that I somehow knew and I didn't want to come back to it. And how could you have known? Nobody had told you that. I, I mean, don't it has know. to have been yeah. an encounter with God Yeah, to be that extreme. And I don't remember what I saw but I do remember what I felt, and I'm telling you, I felt every single emotion all at one time. Mm -hmm. It was anger, it was happiness, it was, I was confused, I didn't know where I was, but I felt everything all at one time, and it was the most overwhelming thing I've ever felt. Melissa, were you a Christian before this happened? I did give my life to God when I was uh, 11 years old, but I believe at 11 years old, I didn't really know mm -hmm. what I was giving my life to, to the extent of what I do now at 28. Mm -hmm. I, so, I mean, I was raised in a Christian home. Mom and dad uh, talked about God. We went to church. We did our devotions, uh, but I, I never gave my life to God when I was a teenager. My okay. actions were more, okay. more about how to have fun and... Well, you're a feisty girl, and I saw oh, that yeah. as soon as I met you, and I knew that you're a girl who, and I, I was too, and I still am to some extent, I want to have fun, and you wanted to have fun, yeah. and that to you was a period of your life where maybe you weren't in total rebellion, but you were just at a place where you were just being a teenager, yeah. right? Yeah. But you believed in God nonetheless. I, I did. And I want to hear more about that encounter, what your thoughts were. When you wake up from this coma, you're talking to your mom, you remember arguing with God. I mean. What what was that like? You're telling me you felt angry, but you also felt happy. What does that mean? I see it's hard because now even looking back, now that it's been this many years, I have a hard time remembering. Okay. I do. But I when I woke up, I do remember that I, nothing made sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what they were talking about. I never knew you could break your neck. I never knew that you could paralyze your whole body. I mean, living, we'd always made the comments like, careful, don't break your neck. Don't yeah. do this, don't do that. Right. But who really digests the reality of what that actually means? Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. And I was very, I was in a lot of denial that this was permanent, that I wasn't going to walk again, that I wasn't going to use my arms and hands again. That I wasn't going to go to the bathroom on my own. I, I, I didn't get it. I didn't, I did not understand. But did you believe at some point because of being a Christian, you believe that God could perform a miracle? I mean, believe that right now sitting here beside yeah. you, that God could, could heal you completely. Get me right up. Right. I, uh, I've been, I've struggled with it, uh, with the whole getting up out of the chair thing. But I would say about four years after the injury, I got the emotional healing. Oh, and wow. I, I okay. began to understand that although I may think this life is physical, it's really not. The okay. physical ends up being a distraction while our soul is suffering. Okay. 
and mine was, and I masked it and covered it with reckless choices and things that I knew could hurt me, but I didn't think I'd get close enough to get hurt. But you're telling me that you were four years paralyzed before yeah. you really came to yeah. totally give your life to Christ. Yeah. What does that look like after four years? I mean, or maybe we should talk about what does that four, what were those four years like? Because that had to be some pretty miserable times. Oh, it was, yeah, it was rough. Right? Uh, there was a lot of anger and a lot of misdirected anger to my mom and dad that gave up their lives for me and my injury. My whole life, they've given up their life for me. But, you know, at 18 to then turn around and basically take care of an infant again with how much help I need, uh, it was, there was a lot of misdirected anger. And I, I can't say I was ever angry at God. I never was directly angry at God because I knew that regardless if this was my first time making that decision or my 20th, that I was on a path where something could have happened mm -hmm. and it did happen. Mm -hmm. And I put myself in this position. And I never was directly angry at God, but after four years, I started to see that, okay, what can God do with this? Good. What Good. can I allow God to do just by surrendering mm -hmm. and putting aside, you know, what I think my life is supposed to be like? So tell me about these six years then. So you were, this is 10 years ago that it happened. You have four years of, of kind of fighting with God about it yeah. and kind of not denying God because you still believe, yeah. but you didn't want to give in to God, yeah, to surrender your will to Him. Yep. So what does do these six years, what have these six years looked like since then? They've been a beautiful mess. They have been, <laughs> they've been crazy. That's a great way to say it. But I love it because I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it because <laughs> I've, I've gotten to a thought process where I've almost been scared for God to heal me. Mm. Scared, not because I think I'll go back to what I was doing. I'm past that point. But just because I see how God's using me in my situation. I feel so fulfilled in my situation that God is using me to help other people. And I'm like, well, God, how are you going to use me if you heal me? And I, I know he will. Yes. I know. I know right. he will. Right. That'll be a whole nother testimony. But I found so much peace in how he's using me right now. And in these six years, I've done a lot of speaking. I've done a lot of just different gigs that I picked up just to help people and find their hope in their journey. You sound like you're really filled with joy and happiness mm -hmm. and yeah. peace. However... Are there those times where you're not there and that yeah. you, you do get down? There are. There are definitely times. Uh, we still experience grief all the time. Mm -hmm. We do, and there's days where I'm just like, oh, man, this could be easier or this could be what I think may be better. But then I start to, I guess, shift my perspective and focus on the things that I do get to wake up to and the stuff that I can do instead of all the can'ts that I could sometimes be you know, surrounded by. But I just try and shift my perspective because I don't do well in negative places. Mm. I don't. Right. I've tried it in those first four years where a lot of negativity and nothing got better. Depression, nothing got better. So I was like, I can't do it. I can't be around negativity. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's not easy and I still face the hardships, but well, I think I'm that's, learning how to depend on God. Melissa, I think that's so good and so wise. And just to think of somebody your age, 28 years old, that you have that kind of wisdom already. But I know there'll be some viewers listening today that say, yeah. hey, I've got a healthy body. I should be joyful all the time. We need to give ourselves permission yeah, to yeah. be okay not always feeling as close to God as we want to feel to God. Yeah. It's okay to experience some down days and some challenges in life. Whether we're in a wheelchair or whether we're we have healthy bodies, you know, when yeah. life throws us those curveballs, we have to just learn how to deal with it. I love that yeah. you say you're intentional about your perspective to turn your negativity into yeah. positivity. So tell me a couple of things that to you, Melissa, might be your biggest challenges right now that you're facing as a 28 year old, absolutely drop dead gorgeous mm -hmm. young lady. What's your biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. My biggest challenges are sometimes I want to speed up God's plan. Sometimes I want to just be like, okay, God, I know you're using me, and I see it and I feel it, but I feel like there could be more. Mm. I feel like there's more outlets, and is my disability what's getting in the way? Because for me, you know, I don't just get to get up and get myself dressed or get ready for the day or, or hop on a plane to the next adventure. It takes a yeah. lot of details. Mm -hmm. takes a lot of planning and a lot of people uh, that, you know, step out of themselves to help me every day. So I feel I've, m one of my biggest things is I just want to speed it up. I want to be like, yeah. all right, God, yeah. I'm 28 now. There's a whole youth that I want to help. And I feel like, you know, 
the older I get, it's going to be harder to relate to them. And because it is, we grow up, we mature, it's just, it's different. So I, I want to speed up the plan sometimes. And I, but again, I'm letting go of it. I know I'm not in control of it. I'm doing what I can while I can and hoping that God uses the most where I'm at. Well, there are doors that are going to be open for you as a result of talking about your testimony and telling your story. Those doors will open. I know for one thing, this is going to sound really strange to you, mm -hmm. but Johnny and Friends is a show that we air here on Good Life 45. And at some point, Johnny needs a successor. She's in her 60s, close to 70, and she's not going to be able to, to do what she's doing right yeah. now. There are ministries out there that, I mean, I can see you being Honestly, this is going to sound strange. You're the next Johnny Erickson Tata if you want to be. Wow. Because you are I, you are touching people's lives. You need to write your book, write your story, get out there and tell it as much as you can. And, and hopefully this will be a vessel for you to maybe people that see the story today and the, hear your story that, that you can be even more impactful because you yeah. do have a story to tell. In particular, you have a lesson Johnny's lesson, I mean, Johnny's uh, one thing that she wanted to teach people is is about impulsivity and to not be yeah. impulsive and to, to oh, not yeah. do, I mean, if you were to do it all over again, you obviously would not have gone drinking that night. All of everything was a result of impulses. Right. So what do you want to tell the teenage girl and boy out there that are listening today? What's your, what is your message to them? Oh my gosh, that... One, it is so hard to grow up in this day and age with all of these distractions. The media, the the music, the TV shows, everything pulls you in one direction to the next. And we get desensitized to these decisions because we see it everywhere. People are doing it everywhere. So it's normal. And they made it back home every time. Or they didn't get pregnant that time. Right. Or they didn't hurt themselves this time. So why would it be me? But the crazy thing is, is it can be you. Uh -huh. It can be us. And it is us. Us. And you know, me and my story is just one example. That one decision that I made ended up changing everything. And not just, just your life, no. but everybody around you. Yeah. Right? My mom and dad still to this day have to direct their life around mine and how we can work together. But thankfully, I have my mom and dad that have given up their lives for me. And it's just been a ripple effect. And it was up to me and them and just a surrendering to make that ripple positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And if I could just help kids any any age. When I when I speak to DUI classes, there's as young as 16. There was a gentleman recently who was 86. Mm -hmm. Every age, is everybody yeah. has Vulnerable. a license. You know, people mm -hmm. that are able to drive, the age yeah. isn't an issue. Yeah. It's making that decision, thinking that you're going to make it back home that night. Mm -hmm. And so often that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I just want to help people understand the dangers behind one decision. I, I hear you and I see your heart and I know that that's what you want to do and I know God has great, great plans for your life. You were telling me before we went on the air and I love this. I think this is so precious. You're 28. Yep. You're ready to get married. And yep. Have some kids. Right? I am. Okay. Well, I'm ready to get married. I don't really know if I'm ready to have a kid yet, but I did tell my mom that for them, for them, I will possibly yeah. have a child. Have you heard of quadriplegic moms before? Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Right? Oh, and it yeah. can be it can happen. It does. I saw a really cool story on Johnny and Friends about a lady who has a couple of kids and she yeah. does great. You yeah. got to have a really strong husband. Oh yeah, and that's that yeah. guy's being prepared for you out there somewhere today, yeah. right? He's he's being groomed. <laughs> I don't know where he is right now. He's, I'm assuming he's lost in nature somewhere because I need a guy that loves the outdoors. So we just okay. wait on that compass. God's got to give him the compass how to find me. <laughs> you are and I'll great. be here waiting. You are great. Physical challenge. What is your biggest physical challenge of any day? Um, physical challenge. So thankfully I have really good caregivers right now, but the biggest physical challenges have been for me, the hardest part of my injury was, was getting used to strangers helping me every day. Mm. People that walk into my life to, you know, give me showers and <laughs> there's no privacy. They see everything, they do everything. And yeah. that was the biggest physical challenge was getting used to yeah. my body, not just being mine anymore. Mm. Yes, it's mine, but the privacy is gone. Right. So that was, that was the biggest physical challenge, but God keeps showing up. He, uh, he keeps giving me the people that I need at all the right times, yeah. whether it's for six months, uh, two years, uh, who knows? But the girls that come into my life, thankfully, there's been a lot of good ones. And my physical challenges don't seem as challenging when I have good hands around me and that yeah. that don't make me feel like a burden or, or a job or 
I just feel like myself, a person. And you are, and a very valuable person in the sight of God, absolutely. So Johnny, one of the things she told me when I interviewed her is that one of her biggest challenges is having her husband <clears throat> have to wake up in the middle of the night to turn her. Oh. Do you have to get turned in the middle of the night? I actually don't. No? I, maybe she, we need to talk. Yes, you might. No, okay, but this is a twin size bed, so I don't know where her husband will fit, but... Maybe someone will develop a king size bed for us quadriplegics, but it's an air mattress and it actually oh, okay. fluctuates the air on my okay. body every 15 minutes. Oh, so every nice. 15 minutes, my body's getting turned okay. with the air and in the chambers yeah. Yeah. moving around. So mom and dad, they get to sleep unless I'm like, hey, uh, I'm a little freezing or I'm a little hot. Uh, but How do you tell them that? Do I you scream. Have a... oh. <laughs> I scream, and they dread it. Uh, but yeah, I scream for mom and dad, and I tell okay. them I'm so hot. And sometimes they walk in like zombies. Other times I'm like, are you sleeping? <laughs> but they help me, and it works out well. What's your favorite thing to do in any given day? What do you love the best about your day? Getting a latte. <laughs> Truly, yeah. that is my favorite thing to do. I love coffee. Okay. I only have one latte every day, but I am addicted to a latte. That's a simple place. And how do Melissa. I drink it? This yeah. is a great thing. Yeah. Okay. How do you drink it? We strap it to my chest. Really? I have a chest strap that I okay. wear for when I'm in the vehicle, okay. and we put a blanket there as a barrier, and we put the latte right there so I can always drink it since I can't pick it up. That is so amazing. So I have to ask somebody for help. Yeah. It's just a little invention I came up with a couple years ago. But going into a coffee shop just makes me feel something. Okay. Being around people. and Aromatherapy too. Yeah. Right? Smells good. It warms good. your body. It mm -hmm. warms your soul. Mm -hmm. You get to meet people you wouldn't have otherwise come in contact with. You get to help people, talk to them, share some good Will words. Will people come up to you and talk to you? Or do they talk mm -hmm. to your caregiver like you don't have a brain? And you can't talk for yourself. Mostly, you want me to tell you the secret to people talking to me? I just lost this little guy last week, but I had a little puppy for six years. And I got him certified as my companion. Oh. His name was Toby Mac. Oh, cute. And Toby <laughs> Mac went with me everywhere. Everywhere I went, Toby was with me. And anywhere I went, people would always be like, can I pet your dog? Okay. And I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. You can pet him. And then it opened up the doors for conversation. Yes. So yes. it was the best conversation starter. And they would start with petting my dog. And then they'd ask me, you know, what happened? Or were oh, you good. born? Were you born good. using a wheelchair? Uh -huh. And it gives me the doors to share with them. Yeah. Not only what put me in the situation about that awareness, but also, you know, just the grace behind all of it. Yeah. And that God gave me a second chance. And then I get to use this chance to populate heaven, right? Yeah. Gather souls. Yeah. My mom says Absolutely. now is harvesting time. Yeah. How are you different today than you were 18 years ago? I mean, we've sort of touched on that, but you seem like you've always been outgoing and extrovert. You love people yeah. and all that, but are you different now than you were at, at 18? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because I never got a chance to grow up. Mm. And I was still a teenager, so I don't know what my adult personality would have been. I do know as a teenager, though, I was I was very self-centered and what, what does Melissa want to do to have fun or, or how can Melissa have a good time doing this? I, I never once thought about other people. Mm. I didn't. And I even have two cousins who were born with cerebral palsy. Mm. So they've never had use of their body like I do now. But in my mind, you know, that was just their story. They have to go through that. Yeah. And I never cared about like, you know, that's a person behind that disability. That is somebody that cares and, yeah. and loves and hurts and feels everything I feel. They just are in a different predicament. And mm -hmm. I never cared about people before. Mm -hmm. And I look back now and I'm like, how did I miss all of this? Wow. How did wow. I not see that there are yeah. people, hungry, hurting people behind the bodies that I come in contact with? Mm -hmm. And I look at it and I, it makes me so thankful that I get to wheel around in a walking world and mm -hmm. I get to see things and observe things and, mm -hmm. and enjoy things on such a different level. Yeah. What that, what do you miss most about being in a chair? Um, I miss, I do miss like getting up in the middle of the night and just wrapping a blanket around me and walking to the fridge and just mm -hmm. trying to find something to snack on, you know, when you can't sleep or, yeah. or getting up at 4 a.m. because one, once again, you can't sleep and just going for a run or, yeah. or I would do random things like get on my floor and just start doing push ups. Wow. I just, I have a lot of energy. I can tell. I don't know how I keep it <laughs> bottled up in this body, but I have a lot of energy. And as soon as the sun comes up, being my eyes are open, I'm ready yeah, to you're go. Ready to 
to go. I'm ready. Yeah. And so I miss just going, yeah. just getting up and doing something. And my, my family rode a lot of dirt bikes back when I was younger. So I miss, you know, the, the adrenaline sure. with getting sure. on a dirt bike and feeling that energy and uh, just that power behind these crazy, I mean, this thing goes eight miles per hour. That's so pretty good. I'm not complaining. Yeah. This wheelchair's got some speed, but it doesn't have that rumble effect. So, But you're probably similar to Johnny in that you would rather be where you are right now and know Jesus as intimately as you yeah. know him than to be where you were at 18, yeah. right? And to be missing so much, yeah, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah, I had my body, but what's a body when your soul is suffering? Oh, wow. That's what beautiful. is a body? Yeah. You know, my body, like I said, it was just a distraction. Mm -hmm. It kept me, you know, distracted by all the things I was really feeling. Yeah. And now that I know that there is a God that loves me, there is a Jesus that came and did what he did, even if it never makes sense. And now it's up to me just to believe that. Just believe it. It sounds easy, but it's not. And that's why every day I take that chance to just get a little bit closer. Praise God for your life and where you are and who you are. And you are precious in my sight, which I know you don't care about that, but you are mm. even more precious in the sight of God. So thanks for sharing everything that you shared. Your journey, uh, your maturity is amazing. Your energy, your personality, your passion for life and your love for Jesus. I am so grateful, viewers, and I know you are too, to have had Melissa Ann come across our path today. She is an incredible, vibrant young woman who knows the Lord and who has dealt with the curveball that was thrown her way. Um, we hope that today's discussion kind of will help you see the power of Jesus in your life. And because our Lord is in us, He can make a difference, not only in our lives, but look at the lives all around us that Melissa has been able to touch and affect. You know, it's one thing for us to sit around here and to talk the talk, and we do it really, really well. But yeah. after we hear about Jesus and we grow in Him, what's next? It's time to be like our guest, Melissa Ann. Have a positive attitude when life doesn't go according to our plan, to decide ahead of time that we're here for something greater than ourselves. She said it so well. We're here to serve other people. So my encouragement to you today is to mobilize your families, your friends, your people, and do something to make a difference in somebody's life. Yeah. Maybe it's just one person, but go and serve. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Stay with us. We have more coming up. Go make a difference. Powerful words and discussions, even challenging in a lot of ways, right? Well, it certainly makes me want to re-examine my own priorities. I want to make sure that everything I'm doing is in line with God's will for my life, being involved in ministries and activities that are pleasing to my Father, and never just spinning my wheels. Well, I know you're super busy, and here at Good Life 45, we want to serve you in the best ways we can and make it even easier for you to find hope in this challenging world. That's why our focus on Welcome Home Go is to encourage you to find ways to serve that fit your lifestyle and your set of God-given gifts. Friends, we need to be learning, applying our hearts to instruction, finding ways to be winsome to the world, but then going out and serving like Jesus would do. He would go and serve others. That's our calling. God's going to use you in ways you can't even imagine. So keep learning and growing, but take another step. You don't have to go across the ocean. Like the program you just saw, we want to share countless examples of ways you can change people's lives right here, right now. Go. Just make a difference in someone's life. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching Welcome Home Go. I hope to see you out there and God bless you. You just watched Welcome Home Go, a Goodbye 45 original production that makes you part of our hope team here on Goodbye 45, where hope happens. Oh,